Hello, I'm Graham Taylor of Potted History. I make replicas of ancient pots, trying to use as far as possible the same techniques, materials, tools, kilns as the original makers did. And in doing so, I gain certain insights into firstly how certain kinds of pots are the way they are, and the lives of the people who made and used them. When I'm out demonstrating, usually on Roman sites, uh, the techniques used by Roman potters, one of the questions that I'm asked almost every time is why, at the end of Roman rule, or the end of Roman administration of Britain, do the Brits abandon the use of the potter's wheel and adopt hand building as their technique for making pottery. I use the term hand building because I sort of like to avoid the term coiling, it sort of conjures up that idea in your mind of the thing that you did at primary school of getting little sausages of clay and piling them on top of one another and scraping them together. And basically ancient pottery making was almost never like that. It's generally a much more robust process that starts off with a piece of clay from which you build a thumb pot and onto which you then add material. Yes, in coils or in rolls, but that material is then used to build the pot, not simply stacking coils on top of one another and scraping them together. And the pot you see me building here is one I made for the Geffrin exhib exhibition, um, a uh, find from Brian Hope Taylor's excavation and of the time period that we're talking about. The evidence for that method of building, as opposed to the thinner coils, is in the pots themselves from all sorts of different time periods. These two you're seeing here are very early pots, but they are built using this more robust coiling technique. And when they're broken, quite often they will come apart in a diagonal sort of joint through the pot. I believe partly this is due to the fact that when they were made, they were often made in the domestic house, around the domestic hearth. Um, and at a time when the nearest bathroom might be several millennia away, um, you're likely to have slightly greasy hands. And if you do have slightly greasy hands, the pots might not join entirely correctly. And here, I've done an experiment where I did, I put some butter onto my hands before I built the pot, built it in the way I'm talking about, and then afterwards, after it had been fired in an open fire to around about 700 degrees centigrade, I deliberately dropped it. And the way it came apart, well, you can see here, it's come apart in these diagonal stripes through. And I then did an experiment where I made a pot by alternating bands of red and white clay and then cutting through the pot to show what happens within the pot. And this is what you see. So I, th I think my method of building these pots is pretty much correct. Not for every prehistoric or Anglo-Saxon pot that exists, but certainly for many and for most. Certainly the story has been told that pottery making arrives in Britain around about 6,000 years ago with the first farmers in the Neolithic and that for the next 4,000 years the people of Britain carry on making pots entirely by hand and almost entirely fired in open fires. 43 AD the Romans arrive and they bring with them the pottery making technology of the potter's wheel, mould made ceramics, kiln fired ceramics, mass production of ceramics. And then in 410 AD, we get the Dear John letter that tells us we're on our own, the rescript of Honorius that says, look to your own defences. At that point, we've got all sorts of barbarians coming in on the East Coast bringing with them their Iron Age culture. And almost immediately the Romans have gone, we move to making handmade pottery, abandoning all that wonderful technology that they brought to us.
The reasons given are often quite bizarre. The idea that the Brits, having thrown off the oppression of Roman rule, don't want anything to do with Roman technology anymore, so they go back to their old ways. It's nearly 400 years the Romans have been here in Britain. Nobody remembers the old ways. It'd be like us what, going back to the Tudors. It doesn't make any sense at all, really. Other ideas are that with the end of Roman rule, all the Roman potters leave Britain and the Brits don't know how to do it for themselves, so they go back to hand-making pottery. That's also nonsense. We know from excavations at places like Vindolanda, Binchester, Bird Oswald, that life continues after the end of Roman rule. The same people are still here, mostly, and they're carrying on with the crafts and the, th and the ways that they've carried on in the past. One of the things is that it suggests that in some way hand-built technology is inferior to wheel-made pottery. And certainly with Anglo-Saxon pottery, that's not the case. Pots like these urns, for instance, are in no way inferior to wheel-made pottery. And the fact is, if you look at them, they are so artistically formed, if you like, that the potter's wheel would be of little assistance in making them. Okay, you could throw a basic pot and then build the decoration onto it or push the decoration out from it. But in actual fact, hand building it is probably an easier way of arriving at this sort of design. And these are fantastic designs. They are beautiful designs. And possibly with more greater levels of creativity than you find in a lot of Roman pottery. The Romans are very much about industrialization, mass production. If one looks back, for instance, to the ancient Greeks, where if you go to the Ashmolean or the British Museum, you will see pots that may have taken two or three weeks in the making. For the Romans, the idea of a pot taking two or three weeks would be absolutely ludicrous. And what they wanted was mass production of pots. So most of their pottery technology was aimed at that. And when you look at the forms of Roman pottery, that's a different talk again, a lot of the forms of Roman pottery are the way they are because it's for the convenience of the potter. With Anglo-Saxon pottery, you're looking at pottery where design takes precedence. So what is the truth? What does happen? Why? Does the potter's wheel disappear and we adopt hand building as a technology? The potter's wheel itself evolves out of the need for mass production. It first emerges in southern Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia, probably around about 3000-3500 BC. And it does so because of the growth of the first cities. Cities are key to the development of the potter's wheel. It develops in southern Iraq, it spreads throughout North Africa, around the Mediterranean, into the Aegean, out to the Far East, wherever city cultures are evolving. And of course that's what it is. It's a mass production tool that will supply large centres of population. And it's probably the very reason that we don't get the potter's wheel until the Romans arrive. We don't simply have the need from it, for it because we don't have settlements large enough to warrant spending all the time it takes to learn how to use a potter's wheel to supply very what are relatively small settlements. It's also true that evidence for wheel-made pottery does indeed disappear within about one generation of 410 AD. It, it's pretty much by the end of the 5th century, there's pretty much no evidence for wheel-made pottery being created in Britain at all. Still being imported, the likes of Tintagel Castle show that Amphora and the like are arriving from the civilised world and uh, the rich are still well supplied but the average people on mainland Britain, nothing at all.
And probably to truly understand what happened, it's necessary to understand what constitutes the potter's wheel in the first place. The potter's wheel probably evolves out of the need when you're hand building a pot to be able to rotate it round so as you can get to all sides of it and so as you can work around the pot and build yourself quite an even form. Even here in Britain there is evidence from Barnhouse in Orkney of pots that have the impressions of a grass mat into the bottom of them. That impression shows that the pot was built on the mat while the clay was still soft and a little bit of sand on a flat stone with the mat on top of it would certainly have allowed you to rotate the pot relatively easily. Certainly not fast enough to throw, but nevertheless allows you to rotate the pot relatively easily. The next step up, of course, is to mount your board or platform onto a pivot so that it will rotate a little faster. And the evidence you see for this is probably where you've got hand-built pots where the rims or the tops of the pots have been finished off very evenly by rotating the pot at a, a slow speed while holding the hand with possibly a wet piece of cloth or whatever to, to finish off the top of the pot. The next step up is the hand wheel. And interestingly, the hand wheel as you see here, still exists in the world, still used in the world. Um, Richard Carton has uh, looked at this in the Balkans quite a lot and found a lot of potters were still using this potter's wheel until very recently and possibly still to this day. It allows you to form pots by actually throwing, but of course because it has no real weight to it and can't continue spinning for any great length of time, it is quite tricky to use and involves pretty much throwing with one hand while you rotate the wheel with the other hand. Although, as you'll see here, uh, I have managed to actually throw on one, um, the weight of the clay acting somewhat as the flywheel and the, the weight of the, of the wheel head itself, which is a fairly solid piece of wood. There's quite a lot of evidence in the Roman world for stick wheels, and stick wheels are probably the first truly fast wheel that developed, and it's likely that in Mesopotamia this is the sort of wheel they were using. Certainly the Greeks were using this type of wheel, the Romans have used it. Out to the Far East you can find them in Japan and China, and in India and Pakistan and Turkey, places like that, they've still been in use till very, very recently. They're a great wheel if you want high speed production of pots. It looks a little bit sort of precarious that you're having to pick up a stick, put down the stick, spin the wheel, get the, the thing going fast, then work on the pot. But you do develop into a rhythm and, it, and it's in fact one of my favourite potter's wheels to work with. I, I absolutely love working, working with the stick wheel and it's the one that I usually demonstrate when I'm demonstrating Roman pottery. The Romans would certainly have also had kick wheels and there are images from Pompeii which show, show potters working at a ground level stick wheel like the one seen here and but there are also images of potters sitting at wheels now in fairness the one that both images are in fact stick wheels um, but from the finds of fly wheels we can be pretty certain that the Romans used kick wheels there would be nothing sophisticated like pedals or treadles or anything like that. It would have been simply kicking onto the surface of the flywheel. And the flywheel that was found at Stibbington is a, probably a recycled quern stone dumped into a potter's kiln. It has holes in it which suggest that it's been used as a stick wheel but it also has a wear pattern on the edge of it which suggests it's been used as a kick wheel as well. So again both types of wheel would have been in use in the Roman world. That's pretty much what we've got there, is pretty much the repertoire of wheels that you would have seen in the Roman world. And it's the types of wheels that were abandoned here in Britain. What does seem to happen is that people start to abandon the cities in the decades following the end of Roman administration of Britain. 
moving out into the countryside, presumably because without the trade networks of the Roman Empire, it becomes difficult to make a living within the cities. And I guess there's all sorts of other reasons as well. Certainly the people who've come into Britain at this stage are not really city dwellers. They are farmers, they are people who live a rural existence. So people are moving out of the cities into the countryside, um, the cities themselves falling into some decay, the population density is dropping dramatically, and much smaller settlements growing up uh, out in the countryside. And as such, I think that the need for mass production simply went away. To work with a potter's wheel, you first obviously got to build one. Um, the simple stick wheel isn't too much of a difficult thing to create, but once you've made it, you do need to store it, you do need to maintain it. And you also are going to have to learn to use it. Using a potter's wheel is generally accepted that it takes you two or three years to really master the use of a potter's wheel. Okay, you can bash out, bash out a few fairly crude pots on it fairly quickly, but to really actually create pottery that's functional, usable in the home, is likely to take you two or three years of practice. Hand building, on the other hand, you can come up with a fairly basic pot that will function in a fairly short time. And it's certainly true to say that even throughout the Roman rule, hand building of pottery did not completely disappear. Evidence from hill forts and, uh, and the like in the borders here between England and Scotland suggests very, very little Roman pottery making its way into those settlements, even during Ro Roman rule. People are at that stage still creating their own pottery. And I'm guessing that's the difference between a barter and a cash society, maybe. But certainly hand building of pottery had continued among the native population right the way through, but not to the extent that it did before Roman rule. So people would have still known how to make a, a pot by hand. But supposing you do decide to continue using a potter's wheel. Okay, so you've trained to use it, you can make your pots quite quickly. In actual fact, if I'm working with a stick wheel and I've got somebody bringing me the clay, and I've got somebody taking away the pots, I can knock out a hundred cooking pots in a day. That's a lot of cooking pots, especially if you're living in a settlement of only 30 or 40 people. So probably didn't make a huge amount of economic sense in that way. The clay I'm going to consume takes a heck of a lot of digging and preparing. If you're hand building, you can use basic glacial clay as it comes from the ground, form it into pots, doesn't matter about the grit. In fact, the grit and the organic material that's in that clay will assist you. Because when you're open firing pots, and I mean by open firing, I mean by firing in a, a, an open fire. People often talk about bonfire firing, but I think most prehistoric pottery in Britain and probably most Anglo-Saxon domestic pottery would be fired in the domestic hearth. You can get up to temperatures of seven or eight hundred in the domestic hearth without risking burning your hut down and achieve perfectly fired pot. Larger pots, more elaborate pots, were probably fired in clamp kilns or possibly in pit firings as, uh, as people talk about and maybe a few potters carried on using the kiln. But basically gritty ordinary clay from the ground is better functioning when you're firing hand-built pottery in an open fire. As a general rule, you need fairly refined clay to work on the potter's wheel, and you need a lot of it, because you're gonna make a lot of pots. So you need a source for that clay. You need somebody, somewhere from where you can dig that clay. You need a place where you can puddle it, mix it with lots of water, allow it to settle out, let the grit and everything settle to the bottom, end up with fine clay. And then you need to prepare it by digging it out, drying it back to the right consistency, kneading it up and preparing it for the potter's wheel. It's a long-winded process. And again, unless you've got the market for the pots, not really worth it. 
Once you've got those pots, you've made your 100 cooking pots, well, you're unlikely to just spend one day on your potter's wheel. You're likely to spend several days on your potter's wheel because so you're likely to have lots of pots. You need somewhere to dry them. If you're a potter in North Africa or Mediterranean country in the dry seasons, you can be fairly confident that you can put your pots outside, you can dry them happily, not a problem at all. Here in Britain, not so reliable. You have to have a building in which you can dry those pots. And evidence of Roman pottery production sites suggests post holes where at least uh, open-sided buildings would have, would have been created into which the pots can be put to dry. You also need boards to stand them on, racking systems to hold them. There's a heck of a lot of infrastructure involved in making pots on the potter's wheel. Once you've dried those pots, you're going to need to fire them. And while you can open fire wheel-made pottery, it's much better finished in a kiln. And of course, once you've got a large volume of pots, if you were to fry and open fire them, you need a very structured open firing, very difficult to control. So a kiln is really necessary. And of course, a kiln needs building and a kiln needs fuel. Open firing of pots can be done, I'll say, in the domestic hearth and can be done with the fuel you're using just to cook your, your food. It can also be done in a clamp firing whereby you are using small amounts of fuel packed in with the pots and ready to go. But if you're going to fire a kiln, you need prepared wood, very, very dry wood, thin wood. You really need to coppice or you need to be making faggots from uh, brash wood. But certainly for the Roman pottery industry, there would have been a whole fuel industry going on around it in order to keep up the production. So there's a whole raft of things needed to make wheel-made pottery production work properly. And I don't really believe that that would have functioned well in the rural environment of post-Roman Britain. And finally, if you have overcome all the other barriers of training, equipment, fuel, clay sources, firing, etc, etc, and you do actually produce loads of pottery in your workshop, how do you move them? Because we've already talked about the fact that generally speaking population densities were low and I suspect the transport, transport networks were not of a level that was equal to Roman Britain. All in all, I think the reasons why the potter's wheel disappears are down to the economics of the society in which people were living. And certainly nothing to do with their intelligence, their creativity or their ability in the crafts. Metalwork, leatherwork, textiles, weaponry, all of these things should flourish in the post-Roman period, but they are all high value, small items that can be traded reasonably easily over distances. Pottery certainly isn't, and the barriers to actually creating it in volume, I think, were probably too great for it to continue as a major profession. If you'd like to know more about my work in ancient pottery technology, uh, creating replica pots from the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, the Roman period, the Anglo-Saxon, creating them using ancient technologies, wheels, hand building, and firing them in open firings and kilns using replicas of ancient tools, go to my web website, pottedhistory.co.uk. Thanks.